Hey friends, your pal Mike Shea from Sly Flourish, here with another episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy DM Prep. In this weekly show, I go through steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master while preparing for my Sunday D&D game. In this case, I am running the hardcover campaign, Rime of the Frost Maiden. This show, like all of the work of Sly Flourish, is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. You too can help support this show by becoming a patron of Sly Flourish. Patrons get access to all kinds of exclusive material and previews of upcoming stuff. Most of all, they help support shows like this. So the, to the patrons of Sly Flourish, thank you very much. I was just chatting right before I started the show that it seems like I was stuck in chapter one for like half a year. And then suddenly I went through like chapters two through seven in like three days. And that's what it feels like because we are actually closing in on the end of Rime of the Frost Maven, which is pretty interesting and pretty shocking. And you'll find out why. And I may have made a terrible mistake. So my characters have traveled through the Caves of Hunger. They defeated Teklili, the vampire knoll, and made their way into Yethrin. Inside the city, they found out that in order to enter the central spire, they need three keys to enter. We'll talk about, we'll talk about this change that I made in a minute and why it might have been a mistake. We'll see. They need to get three keys. They found out that another group is also seeking these three keys. That would be Avarice, the member of the Arcane Brotherhood, uh, the wizard of the Arcane Brotherhood, who in this version, in my version, she has been working with the drow from the Knight's Kiss, a group of drow assassins that have been hunting for one of the characters. And they, they have been hunting particularly for Shadow. So two villains have grouped together to both, you know, they know that they're, they're they know that they're doing the same thing. And we're going to see how that goes. So the characters went around, they traveled through a couple of towers, and then they went to one of them and found out by looking at tracks and trails on the ground that the other group had already been at this particular tower. And then it occurred to them, why are we going for these keys at all? We know they're going for the keys. Why don't we just jump them at the door when they show up? And I was like, oh man. That's a really good idea, right? They're like, we don't have to hunt the keys. We know where the key, you know, I don't have to go where the puck is. I go where the puck is going to be. And I know there's going to be three keys at that door when Avarice grabs them and makes their way there, right? So I was like, that's really cool. And so that is where things are headed in this next game. The problem is, and the thing that I worry about is, there was a lot of cool stuff going on in the city of Yethrin that the players are not going to see because, because of this. So this gets into the potential mistake that I made. I did not like, when I read it, and I had this discussion with my friends, Jeff Greiner and Sam Dillon about it, and they scolded me, and we will talk about the scolding. I don't think I was wrong, but we will talk about that scolding. And the... So the way the book operates now is that there is this central spire. It is protected by a shield. And in order to get through the shield, you have to do like eight different little weird things, eight little rituals to get inside. And the key for each ritual exists inside of each of the towers of wizardry around the area. Some of the towers have collapsed, so you have to find the, you have to find the, the key somewhere else. It doesn't require spells to do necessarily. It's like anybody could do it, like set fire to a leaf in your hand or you know, blow on something. They're, they're like the four things for the, uh, the fifth element, right? If you saw the movie fifth element, there's like four pillars and you have to like use fire and water and air and whatever dirt, right? They're kind of like that. And my question was, why would the wizards have a sphere, have a, have a protective shell around their central spire that can be bypassed by anybody who goes and reads these things? Like, why would they, why would those be available? Now, there was one part of it that my friends that my, my friends Jeff and, and Sam brought up, which was this is a protective shield that occurred when it collapsed. It's a failsafe. So for a failsafe, it would make sense that maybe there were passwords that other people could use to get there. I still think like it's really weird to write your failsafe passwords, you know, your failsafe keys in five different, you know, in five different areas, right? That that or in eight different towers. It didn't make much sense to me why you would do that, right? I said it's like it's the wizard's equivalent of writing their password on a sticky note, right? And then Jeff said, yeah, and in the Tower of Illusions, it's not even the right one. It turns out that the, the, the illusory one is, is, face, is fake. And there's another one. I'm like, so it's like writing two sticky notes, one over top of the other, right? Like that doesn't make much sense. So I didn't like that idea. I felt like, you know, and then, and so the scolding I received was, Mike, 
this is the way D&D is. Like sometimes there are just puzzles for puzzles sake, right? It doesn't always have to make sense in the story. If you go back to the D&D of old, they often had these arbitrary puzzles where, you know, to get into the final vault door, you had to fit, you know, figure out some kind of puzzle to do it. And I was like, yeah, I know. But then I was thinking about it, I'm like, I don't know. I think about old school adventures and the, the good ones. Did they really? Have, does Castle Ravenloft have something like that? You know, does it have sort of a, like, you know, Tomb of the, the Tomb of Horrors, for example, has stuff like that. But the Tomb of Horrors is designed to do that. It's designed to punish people, right? It's like, that was why a Sararak did it. If you look at the Tomb of the Nine Gods, it's the same way. It has all kinds of puzzles in there. But there's, in, at least when I ran it, there was a reason why those puzzles existed. They were dorking with you right in this case like the wizards didn't have a reason for somebody two thousand years later to to come up with a bunch of puzzles to break the, the door down so i i get that like hey and then they're like hey my players enjoyed it and they never even considered why the wizards would have done this and i'm like okay i'm like i think some of my players would have right like i do like i can tell when i'm playing a game and there's like an arbitrary puzzle that we have to solve and it's like why am i doing this right and video games do it all the time right like god of war you're shoving boxes around and it's like wow hey there's that i have to knock that rope down so i can climb up the thing well i'm glad somebody put a rope there because if they didn't this game would have been over right so i think like i'm not a fan of puzzles in general for this reason that i think like it's like if you had a it's a, it's like if you your key to get into your house was a sudoku puzzle right and you're like no one can get in here except me or anybody who can figure out sudoku right like that doesn't seem like why you would block if you don't want somebody to get in you make sure they can't get in right you don't right and so that's why i said okay there is this magical shell of protection it's around the central spire it's protecting the most powerful power source that they have two actually the mythalar and thrun and you need keys to get in, but you need three keys to get in because they don't trust any one wizard. You got to think like a Netherese. Like, what do the Netherese do? They say, well, we want to have a shell of protection. We nine wizards or eight wizards, however many wizards are, archmages, right? We archmages are the only ones that should be able to get in there, right? We're the only ones that should be able to get in there. We don't want any rabble rousers getting in there. So we're going to go in. But I don't trust any of you others. So it's not like any one of our keys can go in. So I think it's better if it takes three of our keys to get in. That... That way, three of us would have to be allied together against the others to bother to go in there. And that's not likely because any three, we're going to learn about it, right? So their thought was three was exactly small enough that it was still doable. You didn't have to get five and the nine together, right? Every time you wanted to go down there. But more than enough to ensure that one corrupt wizard couldn't completely screw things up, right? It's like the two key thing on for nuclear codes, right? You don't want, you don't want like one person with the key isn't good enough. And this one, it was three, right? So that one, from an in-world standpoint, makes more sense to me. And the way to do that is all of the archmages had magical devices, right? They all had magical magic items that they loved and that were part of them and they always had on them. And they said, these key, that my bracers are keys that can allow me to get in, right? My staff is a key that allows me to get in. My jeweled skull is a key that allows me to get in. And that way it takes three such keys to get in and you have to go find three such keys. And then the idea was the players could decide which towers they wanted to go to. I could steer them towards the towers that were the most fun. They could get the three keys and go in. But then they had the idea of like, why are we getting keys at all? Why not just let the other group break in? Like, why do we have to be the, the ones to do it? Which is a really good question. And it probably would have been a question even if you were getting those different things. Like they could say, well, let's just wait at the door for them to go do the ritual. When they do the ritual, we'll go in. Where does that leave me, right? Where does that go? So I don't know. But that, that, that was all the thought I have about the keys of Yether and everything like that. The thing I worry about is I think there is fun stuff, right? That I paid money for to run in this adventure that I would like my players to see. And I don't think they're going to see it because they decided like, we, we don't have to go to all those dumbass towers. We can just wait at the door and the bad guys will be there and we'll jack them and get their keys, right? So that is an interesting situation. So let's get our gaming notes together. First, we're going to generate a session planning template. We are 5 December 2021, Sunday Frostmaiden. First thing we do is review the characters. Uh, I don't know that we have anybody out today. Well, let's, we can just for fun, we'll look at thumbnails of the characters. So we have six characters. We have Ilda, a half orc, or sorry, half elf, half Goliath barbarian who, as she is getting closer and closer to the elder evil Thrun, which is trapped in the sarcophagus in the chambers beneath Yethrin, she is becoming more and more of her powers are starting to manifest around her. And where is that going to lead? I'm not sure. Maybe we'll figure that out today. 
Uh, Shadowhawk is a half mind flayer, half drow who has a mind flayer symbiote that is giving him mind flayer powers. That's pretty. He is being hunted by a group of drow assassins known as the Night Kiss, Knight's Kiss. The Knight's Kiss are here in Yethrin, having allied with Avarice to try to get into the central chamber, but they want him. So that could be an interesting thing that they don't necessarily care about going to the central chamber. They care about grabbing Shadowhawk and bringing him back to Menzer Baranzen. We have Auk and Dawncaller. Auk and Dawncaller is a uh, Goliath. He is the half brother of Ilda. And he also was given Thrunish blood at an early age, which is changing him slightly. I don't know how, and maybe not so much. Uh, Gorwan Alcazar is the straight man in the group. He is the only one that doesn't have some kind of twisted corruption that has occurred, but he is instead corrupt anyway because he's a noble who seeks money above all else. He's a pure capitalist. And he is the secret heir of the Grey Castle family from Waterdeep. We have Perrin Fat Rabbit, who had been abducted by Mind Flayers, but managed to escape before they had implanted anything. But he does have like Mind Flayer web work of web networks inside of his body. And he has a cool bow and he believes in conspiracies and he's a little out there. Uh, Candle in the Dark died three sessions ago and a new candle in the dark was born a vampire. So original candle in the dark was a tabaxi rogue who loved his family, but then he made some uh, choices during the trials of oral that shook him to the core and uh, disturbed him enough that he then ended up drinking the blood of, of an elder evil, another elder evil, otherworldly entity, not quite an elder evil. And it turned him into a half vampire. He made a saving throw. It was my favorite saving throw of all time. I think where I said, he, he's like, I go and I drink that stuff. And I said, make a DC 16 constitution saving throw. And you really want to make it. And he goes, I rolled exactly a 16. And I say, you die. And he's like, I died on a save? Like, what's the fail? Right? And it was because he returned as a vampire. And he probably would not have returned as a vampire if he failed that saving throw. I don't know what would have happened. But I was like, his choice to drink it. So those are the six characters uh, that we've got. We could probably take a quick look at like their stats and stuff. Any interesting skills. One, one thing that's worth kind of doing is like just doing a quick summary of like interesting skills. Uh, somebody brought up like tool proficiencies. It would be really good to put tool proficiencies in this train skill section so that you can see what your what your characters are bothering to put their, their stuff into and interesting languages and stuff like that. One of them, Perrin, is wearing a mask now. Perrin has a new, he can speak, he can speak Loris, which is the language of the Netherese because he is wearing a mask that is possessed by a mummy lord who can help him speak, can help him speak Loris. So those are the characters. The strong start. So they let's let's pull up a map. So the characters are here in Y26, which was a tower. They ended up not going into the tower because it turns out they saw that the Knight's Kiss and that Avarice had been at this tower already and figured they already got a key. The reality is there is no key there, which gives them a little bit of time. As I think it gives them time to figure out like while they're waiting for uh, the others to get their keys. They might have time for things like a, a long rest. I guess the big question of, is like, you know, now that I'm at the end, before we figure out like what the strong start is and everything like that, I, I really want to think about like what, let's, we're going to add a new section here. What needs to happen, right? And this is for the campaign. And like, you know, as we're ending the campaign, so face avarice, face orals, three forms, face Father Lymech, seal the sarcophagus of Thrun, maybe, uh, option for time travel. I think it would be, so one nice thing would be the Remoraz return. That might be really fun for the final conclusion, having the Remoraz bur burst through the floor in the chamber of Thrun. Right, might be really. Are there other? Yeah. You know, so I, I, I did a poll. I, I wish I'd, I, I wish I'd done better homework because a lot of people offered up what are the great things that you should really do in Yethrin, and they gave me a list of like fun things. And there's like the brain in the jar. Let me see if I can kind of go through the the chapter real quickly. Is there any other interesting things? They faced a tomb tapper, but they might face more tomb tappers. That could be interesting if we need those tomb tappers are really nasty. They face some Nothics. We already saw that. Let's take a look at the random table. Don't really need any of this. Cold light walkers are certainly options. Cat, come here, giddy. Where are you going? Demos Majin. I think they faced Demos Majin. So they already seen that, right? So I don't really feel like they have to do they don't, they have to do that. 
The question is, what else was going on in these towers that was really fun? And I know there's like the chain lightning, like play the games at the chain lightning stadium. That didn't grab me. The idea that like, oh, we'll play a game. It's like, eh, lame. That didn't, that didn't grab me. Demos Majin, the, the doppelganger. So that was near jail. Actually, my other group is, is running into that doppelganger. I don't think I really need that. The night hags, not worried about that. I don't need any more hags. I think I even mentioned that they were down here a long time ago, but I don't think anybody's remembered and I don't really care. A House of the Arcane, nothing that runs right out. Nothing that jumps right out. So there are, if you are looking to, we talked about this last time. If you are looking to spice up your towers, if you're looking to spice up your towers, there is a series of a series of PDFs, a series of supplements on the DMs Guild written by Dan Daniel Kahn. You can pick up the whole series. I did. I think it was like it was relatively Yethrin Expanded Towers bun mag Magic Bundle. I think it's ten bucks, twelve bucks. And these have expanded maps and towers for, for every one of the eight towers. So if you're looking to fill them out more, you can pick these up and expand them. I, I think I'm beyond that at this point because I'm really just saying like, what was in the book that I wish I had done that I missed? I'm wondering whether or not the Arcana Loth might be an, an interesting other ally. How, how powerful is an Arcana Loth? They are CR12, pretty powerful. And the Arcana Loth was doing what here? Is it, it, is it possible that the Arcana Loth allied with avarice right that might be kind of fun there is the, the nether oak the the trent right that could be kind of interesting they could sort of hear about this stuff that they didn't do there's another one that is a one i remember is a doing the green slot observatory demi lich is here where's the brain in the jar where's the the, the walk and brain in the jar liquefaction chamber oh so this is this in the i think this is in the tower right so if they go into the tower the Spire of Erotholus. Is that the central spire or is this a different place? Yeah, this is the central spire. So I think this is a good place. Like they could actually travel through this once they've gotten through. That could be interesting. And then find the, the central spire that leads down into the chambers beneath, leads down into the chambers beneath Yethrin, where the sarcophagus of Thrun is. The ballroom is weird. But what would happen... Yeah, what would happen with Avarice here? I like this idea. The brain in the jar affixed to a helmed horror is pretty cool. I may need to do a little bit of homework beforehand and read this particular chapter, read this section. It's kind of funny that there's almost two sections, right? There's the central spire and the and the city itself. And I guess this guy's inside that central spire. So there be, there is opportunities to kind of drop some of the stuff that is that they're missing there. But what could happen? What so let's get back to our game, right? What what else needs to happen? Is there anything else other than these things? So character-wise, like, are there character arcs that need to occur? I don't think so. Like, I think, you know, defeating the Knight's Kiss, I think that is a, that is certainly an option. That, that's certainly something that should happen. I think one piece of the Strong Starve is Ilda grows a pair of spectral black wings. She can't fly yet, but she's starting to appear a lot like, right? She's starting to turn into something. I mean, that's a fun Strong Start. Probably an explosion on the other side of the city. That kind of shows that the other group is there. I think they'll probably face... So let's see. They could have a random encounter on the way there. So like uh, as they're making their way from the tower that they were at over Y26 over to Y6, they've already did Y4. They've already traveled back here. So as they're making their way through Y6... Ah, well, that's the jail. I think Y5 is the jail. So that could be a fun thing. They could have that doppelganger, right? Xerophon from the prison. I think that could be fun. When you run the adventure, do you show your players the map with the numbers on it? I do. I have been showing them the map with the numbers on it because I show them the map because they can see the whole place. And then, you know, they can, it's just an easy reference point, right? So I definitely do that. There's probably, so the Knight's Kiss probably split up into a couple of groups, right? This could be a secret. That's night. One that traveled with Avarice to get the keys. The other to secure the other to secure the doorway. All right. That that those are two. That's something that they did. What else? Father Limac can walk in and out of the field surrounding the inner spire we've got that they probably we need to have some time for a long rest right and i think it'll be like while they're waiting to ambush avarice 
that that could work out. Other, what other secrets could they learn? What are some other important secrets that they can pick up? The instability, the proximity to Thrun is slowly corrupting all of the characters. They will become twisted horrors. They become cursed if they stay more than a couple of days. I e you get one long rest. What else? The Netherese had multiple fail safes, but they failed when the goddess of magic when myth Mr. Netherese had multiple fail safes, but even they failed when Mr. fell and the weave of magic. One of the fail safes was a way to turn back history itself. They found out that it doesn't exactly work perfectly. The multi the multiverse paradox. Mistral is the old goddess of magic before Mistra, back from the, the time of the Netherese. There was a different, it was kind of a different, I think she like got resurrected and changed her name. What other secrets do they pick up? What's going on with Avarice? Avarice became, Avarice became the avatar oral when the characters turned away from her at the trials. So Avarice picked up or oral cannot see Thrun, but can see the power coming from Yethrin and seeks to use it to fight, to destroy Malar, Talos, and Umberly, who threw her from the Pantheon and caused this whole problem. Hey, Cannibal, thank you for gifting subscriptions. That's really cool. Nice thing to do. Thank you. Let's see. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So three more secrets. The last three are always the hard ones. What else? Ly Father Limac. Father Limac was once the lead caretaker of Thrun's sarcophagus as a member of the Knights of the Black Sword. Any other interesting Father Limac stuff? Thrun's corruption turned Father Limac into a lich who seeks the release of the elder evil in the world. Oh, what else? One last secret. We have the spire. We have Thrun's sarcophagus. I haven't figured out what they're going to do with that yet. I should be, I should be thinking about that. Uh, we'll hang on to that secret. So fantastic locations, we have Yethrin. Uh, we have the inner spire. We have Thrun's uh, sarcophagus. NPCs, we have Avarice. We have, we have Zeke. Don't forget Zeke. Zeke is their uh, mummy, drow mummy. Delicos, the strife hunter, is the mummy mask that is being worn by, being worn by Perrin. I think... That is all they, and then we have our, our good old friend, uh, Jan Thalwar is there. So we got plenty. Oh, and then we have this new one, right? And we might want to make a card for it. So Xerophon, make a new card. I can't click the button because it's so far away. Xerophon, the doppelganger. Doppelganger prisoner of the Netherese. What does he appear like? We could just randomly pick something. All right, let's just pick a random NPC. Uh, a loving, uh, neutral, good halfling bandit wearing leather armor and carrying a short bow. That could be what he appears like. We don't need to, because he likes to, he'll use a disarming form, right? So let's find an image. This one works pretty well. He looks kind of grim. Let's stick him in there. Because he's been trapped there for like 2,000 years. And they're all going to be like, you know, hey, look, the, the position came out just fine. Whoops. There we go. So I think that's it for, and oh, and then we add them here, right? NPCs, there. Monsters, what monsters are they gonna face? So we know they're gonna face some, so I'm thinking that what happens, I don't know about an encounter along the way. Like there's, is there a cool encounter that they should run into while they're traveling through Yethrin? Some kind of cool, fun thing that clearly is a, you know, kind of makes Yethrin alive. So I think the Xerophon thing will occur, but I think, you know, some other encounter on the way, right? Maybe I'll just roll random. I think I've got some encounters, so I'll take a look at my encounters and see what I got. The first wave, 
of Knight's Kiss are guarding the Spire. So what would that be like? Again, we start with the story. What makes sense? So she probably, I, I, the Knight's Kiss probably, because they're down here in the Underdark, they probably have a fair number of people. So I would say it's probably, we could actually build an encounter, create new encounter. These are Drow, uh, the Knight's Kiss defenders, right? And we have Drow. So they probably have, how many Drow? Eight? Is eight too many? Is that too much of a pain in the ass? Ah, uh, we'll throw them in the list and see. Certainly a drow mage, I think makes sense. And then some drow elite warriors are pretty good. Eight is a lot. Well, eight, eight's, yeah, but when they're low level, like they're going to get wiped out really quickly. It's more flavor. But how many, how many would they send? And there's kind of a fun thing, like their job is to sort of alert, you know, they'll have to alert the other group if somebody actually shows up. So I think a drow mage is a drow mage is leading the group. Probably three drow warriors are there and then you know eight regular drow. It says it's a deadly encounter. It's not going to be that deadly. I'm not worried about that. What's the deadly encounter benchmark? Let me think for a minute. So we have six characters. They are ninth level. Six times nine is 54. Is that right? That sounds right. Divided by two is 27. So I can theoretically put 27 CRs worth of monsters in a battle before it theoretically is deadly. Uh, I have 15, 22, uh, eight times a quarter is two, so 25. So I am. I don't think I'm in the deadly benchmark. Like they do because of the number of monsters, but I think that is actually still under under the deadly threshold, which is fine, because that's what makes sense, right? You, you wouldn't think there'd be more than this group guarding, you know, guarding the other, guarding the other group, and they would probably leave a lot of their scrubs behind, right? You just stay here and watch. We don't want you getting killed by fireball traps, right? So I think that is. Good, we will save that encounter. And then we have to think about the other group. I think, can I just grab this? I can do in my monsters, I can say knights, kiss, defenders. And then the avarices, avarice and the knights kiss leaders is the next group. So we create another, how do I make a new encounter? Oh man, create new, All right? Avarice and the knights kiss leaders. And likewise, so I think in this case we have avarice. Right. And then we're going to have, I think, a Drow Assassin, certainly. Got to have a Drow Assassin. That's one of the leaders of the Knight's Kiss. Who's the other leader of the Knight's Kiss? Well, let's take a look at the Shadow Blade. Two attacks with a short sword. If either attack hits the target is within 10 feet, if five feet, the attack has Drow can dismiss the darkness, take two, the tug, cause a target. I think we're going to throw a Shadow Blade in there as the other Knight's Kiss. That's really dangerous. Right. Woo, that went into deadly fast. So what do we say it was? 27? 25, yeah, right? 54 is 27. So 27, so we are at 715. We're at 26 with just the three of them. And that's probably true. If we add some veteran, probably two veterans. And act, so action economy wise, are they still weaker? They are. Because there's six characters. And then for funsies, we'll throw three more. This is going to be a big fight. So there'll be four more of the regular drow, right? They're scrubs. That's crazy. What? So the the, the deadly threshold is one hundred and fourteen thousand one hundred, and we're doing thirty five thousand six hundred. So we are, you know, we're crazy high. But I think it'll be. Okay. I don't know. We'll see. And then so that's Avarice and the Knights Kiss leaders. They know it's going to be tough, right? And also remember, the characters are likely going to be able to ambush them, so they might get. It might be easier. I keep calling spelling it wrong. So we've got that. And then Oral, right? So when Avarice falls, the three forms of Oral show up. And when that when she shows up, probably the other Knights Kiss are gonna they're gonna flee. They're gonna be like, we're done with this. This is not worth it if there's any remaining. We'll see how that we'll see how that plays out. But again, so, uh, uh, Oral will be an enemy to all, not just to the characters, but to any remaining drow. So my idea is that Avarice is holding Oral's presence in her and when avarice falls all three forms of or, or each of the three forms of oral appear after that right the crystal appears and then the maiden and then the, the mother and they've seen them all before but they're going to face them all one right after the other and that's going to be really interesting so this is a big 
uh, a great big multi-part fight, All right? I guess we'll just say oral. Treasure. Let's do some treasure real quick. I think we're going to throw... So let's see. If I throw a Staff of Power, who's picking that up? Certainly Shadowhawk would pick that up. Is that a mistake? He ain't going to have it very long. Globe of Invulnerability. I think we're going to do it. Staff of Power. That was one of the keys. So she picked up three keys, right? Avarice has three keys to get in here. Probably an Ion Stone. Which one? Oh, she's probably got an Ion Stone of Absorption, right? And she'll use it. So if they cast spells against her, she'll she'll use it to absorb spells that are cast at her. Use your reaction to cancel a spell of fourth level or lower. By a creature you can see and targeting only you. Is there a better Ion Stone? That might be fun. It's a lot of Ion Stones. Anyway, worry about the player breaking the staff. No, but that would be... I could throw a Intellect. Yeah, Ion Stone of Intellect. I like the Absorption because she could use it. So we'll see. It may be absorption. It may be intellect. We'll see how that goes. What's the third key? What would be something that a mage really loves? What are like, you know, and this would be, these are arch. The reason why these items are so powerful is these are items that an arch mage wields. Let's look at the, let's look at the tables of magic items. And we're going to go to the, the big fancy ones, right? So we're at the end of the adventure too. So it doesn't matter. Ring would be cool. Not of three wishes. That's these are probably too. These are too beefy. Let's just do a quick look. Rod of lordly might is fun. Ring of regeneration. Ring of regeneration might be cool. And the cool bit is uh, avarice has all of this stuff, right? She's she attuned herself. So I think those are the keys, right? Those are the three keys. And the idea might be that she could escape. Like she could drop down. How could that work, right? Maybe she falls, but the ring of regeneration, she doesn't die. And then she wakes up and she runs into the room and then they have to chase her through the spire. Could be, could be a way to, uh, an, interesting, an interesting turn of events. The Rod of Lordly Might. It's really powerful. That's complicated. Robe of Stars. You can go to the astral plane. Good old wand of lightning bolts, but you wouldn't have a wand and a, and a uh, staff of power. Oh, she also has a horn of blasting, right? That she brought with her because she used that to get into this place. Boy, we're like swimming in treasure, but I guess that'll be okay. I'm not going to worry too much about that treasure. So somebody awesome fun time says, are you planning to still have some time travel? I am. I don't know how I'm going to fit that in. Something about like that the Mithalar can still open up a, you know, that there was a spell. And maybe this is the final secret, right? That like the Mithalar in that channel's throne had a time traveling fail safe built into it supposedly to turn time back across the sword coast i don't know how that's going to play out second wave of knight's kiss arrives fight avarice plus knight's kiss fight three forms of oral enter the spire Travel to the antechamber of the Sarcophagus of Thrun. Face Father Lymac. Seal the Sarcophagus. And I want some like choices. Hard choices. So what are some of the hard choices? And some of this like works out, but the idea is like, okay, maybe I just worry about the situation and not so much the choices. So I think the situation is that Thrun is breaking free from his sarcophagus. Father Lymac believes that either Aachen or Ilda are capable of opening the sarcophagus completely and might do so. If, if Thrun gets free, Thrun will devour, probably devour the world or it will be very hard to stop Thrun. If something terrible happens, they have the opportunity. Like I, I would like them to have the opportunity to go back. Maybe like I want, here's the trick, right? I want to have the time travel element. But I want, I want the players to have the choice about whether they do it or not, right? And so that way they can have some agency over what they do. Why would they, is there a hard situation that could occur? I mean, it, it will depend on how well things work with Father, with Father Limac and with, with the sealing of the sarcophagus. What does it take to seal the sarcophagus? I think, does it take a sacrifice to do it? Is somebody going to have to sacrifice them? 
And it could be anybody that's got the blood. So it could be three characters that we're willing to sacrifice, right? A character with the blood thrown must sacrifice themselves to seal the sarcophagus. I have a feeling that three characters will all be willing to. So the three that would make sense, could it be anybody? Or does it have to be somebody? And, and why? And how does them sacrificing themselves, how would they sacrifice themselves to seal it? All right, like what would they do? Is this the ghosts of your parents show up and say, you know, place your hands upon the sarcophagus and give yourself over to it and you can seal it and protect it the same way the knights, the original knights of the black sword did many centuries, right? That like, so, so two, you know, three millennia ago, the elves brought Thrun into the world and they built the sarcophagus and the knights of the black sword were there to protect it, but they gave themselves over to it. But they could say like the first knight, so that could be a secret, right? That like the, the first knight used themselves used their own souls to seal Thrun in the sarcophagus. So it's going to take a soul. It's going to take a soul to reseal it. it. It's going to take a soul bound to the elder evil to seal it. That would limit it to three people. That limits it to Auken and to Ilda and to Candle. Is that taking things away from Perrin and Shadow? Shadow's not really going to care. Perrin would be more than willing to sacrifice himself. And Gore certainly would not. Gore would be trying to figure out how to sell it. So I don't know. But I think that's an approach. I think that's something that's going on. So I think we're, yeah, we're pretty well set. How would I feel? I wish I had that encounter. Well, we were going to, yeah, one last thing we'll do. And then we're going to call it a day. So let's look at, where's my locations? Cat. Let's take a look at Yethra and encounters and see which ones. I did the living tomb tappers. They already faced cold light walkers and eh, gibbering mouthers demos. And yeah, they've already fought. I don't, yeah, none of these encounters are grabbing me because they've already faced Nothics. They've, you know, we're going to face a ton of these guys. They face one of those dudes. They face these guys. Then I think that we're going to have the Remoraz show up in the middle of a profound fight. I think that could be cool. I'd love some other cool Yethrin encounter to happen on their way. Like, you know, as they're traveling, I don't know what that would be. So dead wizards, right? You have, what could be here? Dead wizards. Maybe is there, are there thrown things? Slod? Could they face some slod hunters that came here? Is that fun? I don't know. They're going to face so many battles. Death slod. I think the idea that maybe a, a band of slods might be kind of cool. A death slod plus, you know, a couple others. Who would a who would a death slod bring along with them? Red slods are red slods the they're big, bite into claws. And they have slod slod eggs. They're pretty straightforward. Green slod. They're spellcasters. They're pretty powerful. Blue slod are big brutes. The dragoon mobs of red and blue slot and invading other planes. Human have to become incubators for new slot. I think they're here because they can feel the power of Thrun. I think that might be a fun encounter. That's kind of, it's kind of crazy. Like slot mercenary. They're not mercenaries, right? Cause that's the other demon type. Let's, let's build an encounter. Worked so well last time. And this one is slot invaders of Yethrin. And I think we'll throw a death slot and three red slot. That is 25 on the CR, which is just about. Finally, the last couple of normal characters can be corrupted. Yep. So I think that'll be a fun kind of wandering around and they might even try to talk to him, but then, you know, slot are not known to be real nice people. I think that will work out. So now I've got an encounter for the trip on their way there. That will be first. It's a lot of battles, but that's okay. All right. We are all set. I've got a lot of material for today. I think we're good. I know where my game is going to start. I know, oh, like Thrun's energy grows more powerful. Then, you know, time is ticking. So I think we are all set for today's game. So I want to thank everybody for hanging out with me today to chat about D and to prepare my game. It's always a great pleasure to talk to all of you. We will see how things go next week. If you enjoyed this show, you can help me out by subscribing to the Sly Flourish newsletter, supporting me directly on Patreon, subscribing to my videos on YouTube, or picking up any of my books. Thank you all very much for hanging out today, uh, for watching the show, and get out there and play some D&D. &D.